my family, my tribe, love to the tribe, love to everyone who has supported the tribe, love to King Brain, love to everybody just dropping in anonymous, I love y'all man, you know who you are, Sheila Boone, all my anonymous family, Javon Yawan Halan, Holland, <laughs> Dre Wisdom, Richard Howe, man, let's see some more, Alicia, Alicia, Lacey Parker, Dara Campbell, Deborah Jimenez, Sharon Ford, Kenneth Persons, Francisco Perez, my man Francisco, Sherry Hightower, see more. Essence Hunter, October Scorpio, Kenny Mark, Francisco Perez, my man, uh, Michelle Maquette, Maquette, Dara Campbell, all my beautiful anonymous family, Chris Johnson, Seymour, Diana Ty Hunter Battle, the sister Ty, the brother Chris Battle, love to the Battle family, true warriors. Don Roos, Don Roos, Hudson, Hudson. Chad, Abermento. I right, love to the family, Chad, man. Been surfing away for a long time, man. Uh, vibing out, man. Great, great bro right there. Same man with Elijah Anderson. All the anonymous family. Love to the sister Vanessa Perkins. I mean, hey. This queen is actually there. This is a sister that left. Uh, you know what I'm saying, from Louisiana, I believe Baton Rouge, by herself, and said enough was enough, you know what I'm saying, I'm going to, you know, rebuild, restart, relearn, empty my cup, you know what I'm saying, be, you know, indigenous, <laughs> straight up, man, and the sister got a, a, a small, you know, beautiful, uh, you know, trailer situation, man, and Thank goodness she did, man, because it was a cold winter. And that's that's beautiful uh, wisdom right there for you, man, while she makes this tra transition, man, and was able to shelter the family, uh, you know, Jason and Mario and the queens, their queens, their family, man. So the Most High hey, hey, has brought all this uh, as fabric together. And so you see, see the sister donating to her own cause. So let's keep support no matter what it is because all this is directed directly, directly to this family, including the sister Vanessa Perkins. Eddie Tuggles, love to you, love to you. See more, come on. All right, more anonymous, man. So this is all what you've done. What you've done has all 100% gone towards this family. Let's keep it flowing, let's keep it flowing. And this is what we do for Drop Nation Headed Home because we believe and setting up a new foundation and this is the family that's doing it now families are going to do it everywhere <laughs> all across the plane this is what you're seeing manifesting in front of your eyes what we're doing now hopefully you know shining shining a little bit you know what i'm saying of a of a path you know for those that are making it simple man like i just, I just want to connect to the creator of my sacred trees so it made sense for us to dedicate this fully to jay Stu. We will be building another one for all, you know, anybody, you know what I'm saying, in general, you know, that's, that's, uh, you know, disconnecting wherever they're going, whatever they're doing, but it just made sense since the family was there for so long, man, and they're rocking out there, uh, you know what I'm saying, as one, you know, along with the creator, making it happen every day through a cold winter, keep giving the family love, it's truly, truly helping, man, I mean, I love being able to, you know what I'm saying, wire it directly and put it in jay's hands and know that it's you know what i'm saying felt and i know it's from the community so let's keep it going man from us drop nation let's support the nucleus of our family ah we're just talking more on mars man <laughs> yeah oh yeah love to the brother chris duncan man for this drop teach me to be priestly we're gonna start here man as we Get a couple minutes out of this, and then we're just going to let Prince Uriel Bay have it. We're just going to ride out, because I know he got some more stuff that we need to hear. So let's get the rest of that. You know, I was going to make part six the last one. This is going to be the last one, because I did say I, want, 
I wanted to really try to finish that uh, Prince Uriel Bay. So let's get a bigger lump out of that today. At least an hour's worth. At least an hour's worth we can get out of that Prince Uriel Bay. So we at least feel like we gave it, you know what I'm saying, a real just sitting, a real just uh, viewing that's been pretty much the anchor through this series. So love for all, all, all your beautiful comments and everything that you've given, uh, you know what I'm saying, to, um, you know what I'm saying, make this valid, you know what I'm saying, make it a valid reality for us all to be building together, connected already, not just under a barrier, but connected throughout. We are connected throughout. All right, man. So, yeah, anytime, man, come over to 42 to drop. I always try to keep it fresh, man, with whatever and whoever is dropping that drop. Love to all the family. Love especially, man. I mean, I always got to throw it back to Lex. No bones about it. Lex, man, has been on his own fighting hijacks, man. Making it hijack free. You know what I'm saying? Fighting hijacks. So, we always got to, you know what I'm saying, um, you know what I'm saying, take a step in that moment. To show our appreciation and say, I love you. My brother Lex Will, I love you. And that's how we rock. That's tribal. You know what I'm saying? And uh, that's what it is, man. So keep it dropping. Keep it dropping. All right, man. And, you know, so what? So what? I like some Coldplay songs sometimes, man. This is a damn good song. Lovers in Japan. Deal with it, man. Don't judge me. I told you all about that, man. Great uh, film drop right here, man. That's connecting that great wall of China. Aight, aight, aight. Yeah, I told y'all, man. We tribal. We tribal, we tribal, we tribal. Alright, man. I'm just trying out some, you know, I just typed in tribal war drums. It took me to that uh, Japanese war music. Samurai battle march, man. That's what y'all been hearing, man. So, that was pretty dope. That was pretty dope. Alright, alright. Let's jump into this teach, man. Love to everybody rocking the drop, man. Support the drop. Supporting everything we do. Supporting the crew, J. Stu, his queen, Camellia, Vanessa Perkins right there, holding it down. You see the trailer, man. Harboring the family. Gave us the time to, you know what I'm saying, put put what we had to do together. Man, I'm so proud of the bros, man. All of all of the family, man. Especially our bro uh, Hiram, especially our bro. Uh, AD, I mean, real spill, you know what I'm saying? Love to Isaac, love to Uno, because I know, you know what I'm saying, all of our hearts, all of our, you know what I'm saying, energy is in the right place, man. So, you know, to be able to pull this off, to do what we've done, to put up what we put up, to put up what we put up in a short amount of time, the creator made a way for us, man. Whoever thought we'd be able to, you know, truly put <laughs> cooperative economics together like this, over 20K, to secure 10 acres, man, to begin a refuge situation as we come into this harvest spring season, as this uh, weather starts, you know what I'm saying, you know, making it, uh, you know, making a way for us, man, um, you know, it's going to make perfect sense, so wherever we go from here, we know that we built it together, you know what I mean, so keep building with us, because we're building for you and with you, you know what I'm saying, we're not just <laughs> over here just saying, oh, we surfing the wave, no, we actually have the land we actually have a tribe we actually are rocking indigenous no matter what you like and what you don't like so all the creator asks us is to be in order is to put no power before our power and we're doing it you can't have no bones about it with us looky looky likey like it all right so love to the crew love to our sister Shalise. love to our bro mario man i mean beautiful indigenous Vibrations to all the fam. Let's get it. Teach me to be priestly. The Egyptian city in the Grand Canyon. Shemitic and Hermetic house of the sun. At Thor Bel Pior. Ah, interesting. Interesting. I'm going to go right into the nine minute mark. Because I want to get about 15 minutes of this before I just give it, uh, you know what I'm saying, to the bro. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Prince Uriel Bay, man. I just want to, you know, give him, his, give him his due, man. We did seven parts on this, so we might as well let him have it. Love to the brother Teach, man. Y'all check out all this. Subscribe. All that. Let go. Let's belly flop right here to the nine minute. Yo, what's going on, family? Uh, this your boy back with another video. Just want to give all thanks and praise to the most high, man, for the opportunity. Hey, to come hey, 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 hey. One more time and build. You know what oh. I'm saying? 
Here we go. Belly fly. Let go. Now check out what they say right here. Literally meaning the Baal of Peor, right? The Lord, right? Baal means Lord of the house of Horus. Now that's, I'm like, man, I'm like, okay, but damn, that's crazy, right? Now, if, even if you keep. Whoa. I mean, if we just walk away at this point, we got so much drop that the brother just pointed out. That goes along with this, the Moor, the Moabite, the Muhammad, the Baphomet of Belus. This is part seven and the final part. And uh, yeah, so Baal, Bay and Els and Baals, Baal pure, pure. What does it say? The Lord of the house of Horus. So we're just talking Horus. We're just talking with the Pharaoh's permission. We're just talking Thoth. We're just talking Egypt. We're just talking Atlantis. Now do you see it's the same gods. He's going to get into with the calling the uh, Shemitic God. Shemosh, Shemesh, Shemesh. Which is, you know, interesting with that C-H-E-M. When you start getting to, into the K-H-E-M's. Kemosh. So is it Shemesh or Kemosh? Either way, you're getting right here to the house of Horus. All right, let's go. I'm going to say an Aramaic inscription found at the year all of identifies Balaam as a prophet of Shemesh, right? Just like the other other tab said, and it says a Semitic sun god. And consequently, it could well be the case that the unidentified Baal of Peor is Shemesh, right? <clears throat> but what's, 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 what's the real drunk, you know what I'm saying, that we that we really looking at? Is this, you remember from... Jewish encyclopedia is a Baal Peor is the same as Beth Peor and is contracted from Beth Baal Peor. But it is three look this this three word um <clears throat> turn right here, Beth, Baal and Peor, like this trick that to what Baal of Peor, the Lord, the Baal, House the Beth Peor, the Shemesh. Son, horse, son, rock, right? So, you know what I'm saying? So, <clears throat> when you do, you dig and whatnot, and you look like, okay, house of horrors, house of raw, because raw and horrors, I guess, when you're looking at it, they, they really eventually become, you know, like the same deity, and like the Egyptian pantheon, I guess. So, but when you look at, um, for a house of horrors, or House of Ra, or City of Ra, you know what I'm saying, City of Ra, you get some interesting things. Okay, so, when you, like I say, when you do that uh, particular uh, research on House of Ra, House of Ra, something like that, see what you can find in, you know, City of Ra, City of Ra, you get Heliopolis, right? So Heliopolis, City of the Sun, right? Beth Peor, House of the Sun. Beth Shemesh, um, House of Sun, or Beth Horus, House of Horus, still House of Sun, right? Um, or City of Helios, Egyptian, whatever that is, was one of the oldest cities of ancient Egypt, the capital of the 13th or Heliopolite gnome of Lower Egypt. Okay, no, no, uh, let's skip down now. This is for the ancient Egyptian cult center, Ayunu, occasionally spelled Anu, named An, that in the Hebrew Bible. So the city of the sun, Heliopolis, the ancient Egyptian city, is is also called An, and that's the ancient Egyptian city of An in the Bible, right? It was renamed Heliopolis by the Greeks, you know, Helio, Greek, um, in recognition of the fact that the sun... God Ra, Helios in Greek, presided there, right? House, you know, you know what it is. Uh, I, Ionu is mentioned in the pyramid text as House of Ra, right? Okay, House of Ra, House of Four, however, because as you're going to see, like I said, these two um, deities <clears throat> are both sons. 
from God, but they eventually kind of like become the same being. Uh, the name Heliopolis is of ancient Greek, meaning city of the sun, as it was the principal seaship of the sun god Ra, right? Um, and the closely related deity Atum. Originally, the ancient city was known by the Egyptians as Eunus, right? As they said of thus, that is what. Shall, uh, no, we're going to start at 12. Say, and I will kinder a fire in the house 
in the houses of the gods of Egypt, right? The gods, who was the gods? Ra Horus, right? So in the houses of Ra Horus, he shall burn them and carry them away captive. He shall array himself with the land of Egypt, and the shepherd put it on his garments. Uh, he shall go forth uh, from thence in peace. He shall break also the images of that Shemesh, right? That is in the land of Egypt. And the houses of the gods of the Egyptians shall burn with fire, right? So that's is telling you right here that Bel Shemesh is in the land of Egypt, right? On Heliopolis. So called Bel Shemesh. But now, so understand one thing, you know what I'm saying? Bel Shemesh is just Bel Shemesh, house of the sun. It's, it's a couple Bel Shemesh, you feel what I'm saying? Because anywhere they got this house of sun worship throughout their lands, you feel what I'm saying? It would be called Beth Shemesh. So as you look, as you can see, um, there's, you know, you got Beth Shemesh of Judah in the Judah territory. Beth Shemesh of Naphtali. Hold on, uh oh. Okay, so as you see, Beth Shemesh of Judah. Um, you got one of Issachar. Naphtali. Okay, then you got the Beth Shemesh that's in the land of Egypt, right? Okay, so, um, you know, catch this, but, uh, this on Bible Hub. But right here, I'm gonna just start right here. If Beth Shemesh is with the house of the sun, then the balancing of the statement would only be, uh, only between the pillars and houses, but it seems more naturally to be between Beth Shemesh, a Semitic place of worship that is in the land of Egypt, on one hand, and the Egyptian place of worship, the houses of the gods of Egypt on the other, right? So that's, that's kind of important right there, what they saying, um, Right, you got the Shemitic place of Egyptian house of sun worship on one end, and then the Egyptian house of the gods of Egypt on the other. You know what I'm saying? Like that's that's, that's kind of interesting. Okay, now so trying to put this thing in perspective. You know what I'm saying with the with, with our land over here in America. We're looking at you know the Utah territory that can or the Moab territory that, <clears throat> excuse me, not can just be limited to the uh, the Utah area, as you can see, back in the day, the, the provinces of the territory was a little bit more expanded, you know what I'm saying, but so what we're looking at is the place of Moab, and the Moab Desert, being in that Utah Four Corners territory, and in this, this, this Egyptian city, right, that they're finding in the Grand Canyon, and we're trying to see What's up with that? Because we got a Beth Peor, you know what I'm saying? A Beth or a house, of, a house of the sun or a house of the Lord, or excuse me, the Lord of the house of whores, right? And um, so checking out this article right here, man, it says <clears throat> ancient Egypt came to America. Was biblical Joseph king over an Egyptian empire in the USA? Evidence says yes. All right. So we're going to dig into this. Okay, so this is a little artifact they found, right? Shoe of the crocodile with the soul that King Zaphnath Joseph chose. The first, uh, this was the first known crocodile hieroglyph of, uh, for any king in Egypt. Now, I'm going to just, you know, get some little bits and pieces out of it. Uh, like right here, I scroll down a little bit to say many generations ago when Egypt was becoming less than prosperous, a man who was blessed by God and that he was given the gift of interpreting dreams came to the United States of America, <clears throat> right? So it says, came to the United States of America to establish a second Egyptian empire. His name was Joseph, son of Jacob. All right, so check this part out right here. Hold on one second. <laughs> All right. And of course, as we, you know, have learned to surf this thing, did he come over here from there or was he already here? This is when we, you know, start to.
connect all this. Now look at the name that they call Joseph. Let's go. And yo, this brother's doing an incredible job. We're going to get a few more minutes, but teach is one of those, you know what I'm saying, real one, day one. You know what I'm saying? From day one, the bro's been real and nothing but real. I mean, uh, the, you know, complete vibration that he's spreading. Uh, you know what I'm saying? The, uh, the you know, the combination, you know what I'm saying? When it gets to, it's not just the info, man. It's, it's, it's the vibe. You, the vibe got to be, the vibe is first. The vibe is first before the info. So he's one of the bros that, you know what I'm saying, just like the bro Hire Mark, man, that I'm going to uh, actually, since he's going there, I got to get some of that Hire Mark back. He's been, you know, putting that nail all in that coffin, man, opening up these uh, these sarcophaguses, these uh, these mummified bodies, man. You know what I'm saying? Nah, man, digging it out, all out of here, man, digging on this drop. So we're going to try to go bang, bang, so we can get into this Prince Uriel Bay. Let's get a couple more minutes, man. Love to the brother Tiggs. Let's go. You know, we're talking about, you know how the story go, but I just wanted to give you some, some of the little, you know, uh, Pharaoh found favor in his wisdom and, and Joseph gained much respect and power. As a result, Joseph became king of Egypt, right? And would then be called Zaphnath, the crocodile. The dream God gave Joseph prophesied coming, drought and suffering, which he delayed to the Pharaoh. These dreams allowed them to prepare for the tragedies that lie ahead. Ancient Egyptians came to America, so did Joseph, and he was their king. Mm. Okay? Okay, so as we scroll even further down, see we got this Grand Canyon, Colorado Tab. Okay, this diagram was uh extremely valuable to the Smithsonian archaeological archaeologists who were exploring the power tunnel in the Grand Canyon. It is a diagram, this one up here of the Egyptian writing symbol used by the ancient Egyptians when they came to the Grand King, all right? And they say Joseph was their king, right? It was a school tablet um, that was utilized for teaching Egyptian children to read and write. Coincid uh, co coincidentally, the animal and bird hieroglyphs carved into the cliff walls of, of the Grand Canyon were used to describe various ranks. Of the king. It's also noteworthy that the rectangle box located at the top of the second row from the left is the Ark, is the Hebrew Ark of the Covenant symbol. Also, later, the lower in the same row is the button, which was the Hebrew symbol for the sun in the right hand. Right? This is stuff they find in the Grand King. Okay. So. And make no mistake about all it. That all around the internet is some make no mistake, man, that, uh, the king you know what I'm saying? The Grand king. These shepherd kings, my bad, my busy. Uh, these shepherd kings were were huge in this so-called Egypt. You know, these shepherd kings, these these lineages, these uh, you know, what I'm saying so-called Hebrews. You know, what I mean, um, you know, whether it's Joseph, you're talking, whether it's Moses, you're talking, whether it's, um, you know, what I'm saying, even you know, some say Akhenaten, you know, what I'm saying had a connection, and others say he was an alien. Some say he was a this, but you know, you hear all these things now. He's going to get into the name that is found, and uh, then we're going to uh, do a good uh, jump into higher mark. It is King Akhenaten and Queen Nefertiti that their ancestors and the children's name uh, are found on the artifact. The Egyptian name of Daphnath, or Joseph, is one of their ancestors. It is recorded that Akhenaten restored the Semitic religion of Amon in Egypt at Suwari, Egypt. Okay, Akhenaten was the ruler in Egypt from uh, 1353 to 1336 BC, and his son Setepreneh was also an Egyptian ruler. It was also recorded that as a king at Saqqara, Egypt as well. This Egyptian information means that Egyptian kings came to the Grand Canyon at various times, but also made return trips to Egypt. And this along with some other information. So again, we're just talking Akhenaten. We're just talking about the Semitic religion of Amon, they're saying. But you're just talking about the law of order of the creator of one energy, one flow. All right. Beautiful. The information man. I will share also means that Joseph, son of Jacob, also came to the United States. Right? <clears throat> so I just find that crazy, man, that they're referring the 
this Egyptian city ran by Joseph. You feel what I'm saying? Uh, the Egyptian king Joseph, the Hebrew Egyptian king Joseph, to be in the Grand Canyon in the United States. Okay, you scroll down some more, you know, they're talking about Zoroaster, Joseph, Temple, the Egyptian le uh, legend of Zoroaster, more evidence of Joseph. Bang, Zoroaster. So remember, we got some of that out the uh, OSB, you know what I mean? But the Zoroaster seems to be a foundational legend for a lot of this, uh, you know what I'm saying, law energy. This Zoroaster that was teaching this law that these people are basing this stuff out of, then they spin it into the same thing, you know, into a version of Christianity, into a version of this, into a version of that. But this is something that we got to dig on, especially if we're going to connect Zoroaster with Joseph. Can we connect that on our own? In our, uh, you know what I'm saying, recon that we're already pulling out. So, very interesting connection right here with Zoaster and Joseph. Now, on that, let's do a quick uh, hop skip into my bro, High Mark. Man, what's so dope is that since I got, you know, most of y'all already categorized, you know, actually, look at this, man. Who got the drop? High Mark. He already got the drop, man. So, let's go ahead and belly flop into this joint. To say and again we're just talking about ancient artifacts found in the Grand Canyon now I just want to belly flop in here to about the 40 I think 2 43 minute mark and we're gonna get into some more of this Grand Canyon about 40 square all right okay so He's written an article called The Egyptian Treasure Cave of the Grand Canyon. Now listen up. This is by William Somerville. Love to the bro, man. He's been on it with this and everything else. This Caucasianism is amazing. No Negro. I mean, you know, let's keep digging, man. Man, we got the land, man. <laughs> My bro, let's go. So yeah, well he talks about the shrine. So this is actually, this is actually Kincaid's uh, first information that he brought forth of his findings in the caves. Okay, so they just waited till the end to present his information. But I'm glad they presented his information with the book, his logs about what he really seen, what his eyes seen. Okay, and uh, like I said, Hatchet, Indiana Jones, he went back to concur that. Okay, so this is his writings. Uh, uh, S.A. Jordan. Remember, they were a team. S.A. Jordan and, uh, and Ken K. were a team. And so uh, we had a lot of mix-ups with the, uh, the, the Gazette article, the Gazette newspaper. We had a lot of mix-ups with the state. I mean, the Smithsonian Institution basically denying the claims of S.A. Jordan and Ken K. But then, uh, as we see further paperwork of Smithsonian uh, giving Kincaid evidence saying that he did submit artifacts to the Smithsonian. So it's just a lot of hitting us over the head with some bullshit. But, which, you know, we vibing and weaving and we looking for food. Yes, we sir. understand that there is clarity, even in a room of fog. Mm. There's clarity. Come on. Israel. Come on. We have clarity. Even in the room of fall. Because Go. we understand what you are trying to hide. So we're just writing your wrongs. We writing your wrongs, man. <laughs> and I know you mad at that. But ain't nothing you can really do about it. Alright. So so by their by their uh instincts they're saying that this was a shrine over a hundred feet from the entrance is a cross uh entrance is the cross hall okay several hundred feet long in which are found the idol or image okay an image of the people's god okay so why would they say it's the people's god i don't know it's just something that they're throwing out there they're saying that this is the people's God. Was it a picture of a black man or a black 
black woman, so-called black woman, melanated, carbonated. Why would they say that, um, you know, this shrine was the people's God, okay? Um, with the lotus flower or lily in each hand, the cast of the face is oriental, okay? And the carving, this cavern. And the carving, this cavern, the idol almost resembles Buddha, though the scientists are not certain as to what religious worship it represents. Taking it into consideration, everything found thus far is possible that this worship most resembles the ancient people of Tibet. So, you know, what what, uh, what scientists or historians will say that uh, they think it was a statue of Krishna or Vishnu. And, uh, you know, I think those are guesses in the park, you know, uh, because uh, doing, due to our overstanding of things, you know, so I wasn't there, so I can't say what he actually saw, but, um, but our conception is misconcepted over what we think our people Especially when you're talking from an invader or an outside interference, because what they learned was wrong. So if they're learning something wrong, then how can they write us, write our wrongs? When we flat out told them, when they came and encountered us from the invasion, that we worship nothing, no idols, that we worship only the Most High, the one true supreme hey, I have. so I just don't understand I don't understand where's the mix up I don't understand where's the confusion if I told you I don't worship this, I only worship the supreme the supreme the creator of all things so who is you worship you know, cause you, and then you still come back with me after I tell you that. So who are you worshiping? Okay. So they, so they, they say surrounding this idol are small images, some very beautiful in form, others crooked, naked, crooked, naked, naked, and distorted shapes, symbolic, probably of good and evil. See here they go again with this good and evil. They always doing that, cause that's what they were taught. This Christianity shit. Good and evil. There are two large cactus with pro protruding arms. Uh, one on each side of the dials, dais on which the god squats. All this is carved out of hard rock resembling. See how they say the god squats. Why would you call just uh, some statue of God? You know, that's just the stuff that they used to, man. Because they are the, uh, they are the, um, they are the murmurs of it, the martyrs of uh, worshiping false gods. That's mm. why turning everything into gods, mm. turning everything into gods. Okay, that's what their specialty is because they know of not the true, most merciful. Okay. Hey, hey, and. These are their gods. Everything that they see as powerful, melanated, they have always worshipped. They worship your melanin. It's God-like to them. It's something else. You know how they be wanting to touch your hair and be like, oh, I've this, uh, uh, you know what I'm saying, so-called Mexican uh, woman Came up to me, you know what I'm saying? I was kicking it with my, my little shorties. And her little uh her little uh, one was like probably three or four, you know. And I'm just like, what's up, little man? You know what I'm saying? Just a cool little, you know what I'm saying, cool little essay, man, you know what I'm saying? Everybody's cool. This is how we do it. We in Inglewood. She come over to me. She like, hey man. He just uh He's never seen, you know, curly hair before. So, 
You know, I think he just probably wanted to touch your hair. He's never seen curly hair before. I am not bullshitting you. I'm in Inglewood, man. Born, raised, turf, L.A., South Central, all that. I'm right here. And this so-called Mexican woman, you know, peace to her. <laughs> Roll up on me. In this little play area, we chilling. And straight up tell me that her little, her little one's never seen curly hair. Now, you know, maybe that's an isolated situation. <laughs> Who knows? All we know is that our people are way, 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 way fucked up right now. And when we're getting this shit like the brother High Marcus, High Marcus kicking, it's coming from them. Everything's coming twisted. And we're trying to, you know what I'm saying? Get the groove, man. We're trying to stay in the groove. We're trying to stay in the flow as we untwist this shit. But the world is getting stranger. While we are getting realer, everything is getting more unreal. Don't you notice the more real you get, the more unreal they become? Let's get a couple more minutes, man. The brother's getting in. Then we'll, uh, you know, make a long flow out uh, with the brother Prince Uriel Bay. We'll at least get a good hour out of it. That's the best we can do. And I encourage you again to uh, watch the whole thing, man, from top to bottom. You got the link. Let's go. Okay, so all, all this is carved out of hard rock resembling marble. Okay? It is opposite corner of this cross. Hall. This cross hall. Were found tools of all descriptions made of copper. Tools made of copper. I can't, I can't even imagine what it looks like. These Made of copper. Down and knew the lost art of hardening this metal, okay, which has been sought by chemists for centuries without results. They can't even figure out how to soften this, this copper metal. Wow. On a bench running around the workroom was some charcoal and other material probably used in the process. There are also slag and stuff similar to mat. Similar to Mac, okay, showing that these ancient smelt ores, but so far no trace of where and how this was done has been discovered, nor the origin of the ore. Remember, a lot of a lot of their discoveries and a lot of their uh, uh, researches um, and their their uh, capability. Their capabilities of doing research is just, I mean, it ain't, it ain't started long ago. Remember, according to them, their first Mayan photo study wasn't until 1876 by Robert Marler. Mm. So not until 1806 were they able to take photos hmm. for study. Okay. Hmm. The first scientific study wasn't even until, until as far as they're concerned, the invaders... 1891 and they just rolled up in california damn near in 1800 all this shit is brand new and when the brothers kick in man straight up artifacts out the egyptian treasure cave of the grand canyon you know what i mean when the brothers just kick in that it started here you can go research yourself the explorer ge king cave how they kept shutting down you know what i'm saying um you know so much of you know, that minority report, but it kept, you know what I'm saying, per he kept pursuing it, of course, you know what I'm saying, lost his life in the process, everybody uh, connected, you know, to that type of research was losing their lives in the process, so when we're getting this to you, this ain't no play play, these people have lost their lives fighting for reality, everyone want the truth, everyone say, you got the truth, you tell them the truth, it's the truth, he got the truth, he got more truth, he got more truth than him. Man, we're saying, who is living in reality? Judge what's real. And what's real is the truth. You'll know what's real on the vibration. You know what's really real. You'll know who a real one is based on vibe alone. 
and you'll know the truth based on the vibe of it. That's why you have to get on and in the vibration of our creator. Hawa. Your creator. Hawa. All that is existing. All that is becoming. All that is and all that was. All that is established. You know? We ride and we rock for our tribe. We ride and we rock for hey, hey. We ride and we rock for Drop Nation. We rock for High Mark, man. I mean, now you see. <laughs> now you get it. That's just a little taste of Hiram and a little touch of uh, uh, Teach. A little taste of Hiram and a little touch of Teach. You know what I'm saying? Uh, keep loving up on our sister, uh, Chandrella Avery, and her fight. You know what I'm saying? Getting this sickle cell research out and brother uh, Dr. CB had a lot to say about that man so alright so now we can get a nice cool flow in the game man we're talking about our earth and we say that which has created that which has given the vibration you know has made uh, these so called molecules these so called atoms these atoms that are 99.9% .9 empty space and if an atom is 99.9% .9 empty space then it is the consciousness that you're swimming in. And all there is is the vibration you're swimming in. That's it. Everything else is empty without the creator. Adam, atom, Adam is empty. An atom is 99% empty space. So, if an atom, what they're calling an atom, the building block of life is 99% empty space. And when I show you a tree and you say a tree is made of these little molecules and these molecules are made of atoms. And they get them broken down into this and broken down into that. I don't care how many quantum times you break it down. It's still 99.9% .9 empty space. And it's still consciousness and consciousness alone. And because you say your consciousness and claim it doesn't mean you're swimming in it. When you want to claim all this as Morocco, as the Moroccan Empire, are you swimming in it? You want all of Lemuria, all of Mu in Asia, all of the Americas here or here, Atlantis here, all of this, the land of Ham and the land of Cush, a father and son story. A Thoth, a Thoth and uh, Asherah Baal trilogy. <laughs> Nah, man. This earth is created in a vibration for the vibration. This earth is created in a vibration for the vibration. So let's take that vibration and flow. Flow on out in their axis consciousness grid, man. Let's flow out in their axis consciousness grid. He's going to break down Philadelphia and America, Jerusalem and America. Let's just go with, let's just go. A good hour of this. And, uh, you know, hey, I can't say I'm not going to interrupt the shit out of it. But at least if I do, there'll be a part eight. But I'll try not to. Let's go. Um, but understanding the seriousness of the situation, these moors uh, of the royal convocation, uh, was again the fundamental reason for one, The formation of the Corporate Family Trust, the National Trust, um, in, again, what later became the United States, and two, the establishing of the federal political system for the Albion Mail, uh, as this was a part of the Moore's C-3 Communications Operation Command Stratagem, or military strategy, uh, that was used to, as strange as it may sound to some, um, it was to ensure the survival of future generations. Uh, you should also know uh, that even though the Moors, uh, or the Moorish Navy rather, more specifically, fell in West Palestine uh, on the Sea of Galilee in uh, 1795, the royal families nonetheless were still running government from behind the scenes until Civil War era reconstruction. Oh, yes, uh, yes. So these families of these particular Moors were still running shit. Up until what the Civil War? Damn. Uh, so initially, the congressional membership consisted of the above thirteen rulers and key family members, that eventually comprised thirty-five members. 
and finally the 20 observers. Uh, only the, the Bay kings, princes, and governors were eligible to serve as praesens, or president, commander-in-chief, uh, of which there were between the years of 1774 and 1889, 16 to be exact. Uh, who not only did they, like presidents of the modern era, sign congressional laws, treaties, military orders, but in addition presided over judicial congressional cases. And in 1775, under the Henry Middleton and Peyton Randolph second term administration, was the beginning of the so-called infamous uh, American Revolution. Now what's very interesting about this is because of how we've been, again, miseducated and taught history, etc., we tend to look at it uh, compartmentally. In other words, we think of the American Revolution, okay, Christmas Attics, that whole thing, and uh, Boston, uh, and uh, Paul Revere, etc. And nothing else was going on. But as I mentioned earlier, you had a 300 years continental war that was going on in many parts of the continent. Um, and this is the war that the bro, a seer, the duke, you know what I mean? Duke of tears. <laughs> was breaking down that was already happening with the melanated family already here. You're talking Moab and you're talking Israel popping off here until they got the reinforcement to take you out with the Spaniards. In parts of, uh, what is it, uh, Guaymi Cuna, known as Panama, Marco Tucano Huitoto, known as Colombia, uh, Yonamam, Arwa Carib, Venezuela, uh, Utuapaque Pima, Mexico, Maya, Guatemala, uh, Arucanian, Chile, uh, Diaguita, Bolivia, and Apibon, Paraguay. Uh, so, in 1775, this American Revolution took place principally uh, in the northeast areas of Brutio, um, what is it, uh, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, uh, and Idumia which are known, Brutium was actually also known as uh, Pergamos, which if uh, you read the so-called Christian Bible in Revelations, they talk about Pergamos, uh, which is uh, Brutium, Massachusetts. Another name for it was Comasa Kunkanit, which I'll talk wow. about that in a minute concerning Hano Bay's uh, legal document, uh, the Bornstone, um, which is an ancient document, ancient Moorish document, uh, that I also talk about in uh, Libretto 7 of the Consecrated Talisman, which is the Moabite Proclamation of Hano Bay. Uh, Yo, we got to dig on this. I know we got these researchers out there. Dig on that born stone, man. Dig on that born stone. Somebody let me know if you got some drop on that. You're about to hear him go into how New York is Jerusalem, according to them. So, you know, let, let's dig on it. As long as it's bringing Jerusalem here, like... You know what I'm saying? Horace uh, Butler is is also doing in his own way. We're also, you know, bringing that Jerusalem, Jerusalem connection. But hey, I've heard Virginia. Now I'm here in New York. As long as we're talking over here, we can connect these things because you're talking about a landmass that might be, you know, you might be included the whole thing. All this could be Jerusalem as far as we know. So let's go. Uh, legal document annexation of the Americas to the Iberian Peninsula. Now, uh, but anyway, getting back to Brutium and where the war, uh, the American Revolution was principally fought, as I said, in Brutium, uh, Massachusetts, um, uh, Jerusalem, which is Jerusalem, uh, also known as Fez Huetas, or Old Fez, which is actually New York. Bethlehem, as I mentioned, is actually uh, Pittsburgh. And Idumia, um, or Edom, is Virginia. Now, we've learned about the ruddy, pale-skinned man, or the so-called the true red, uh, red man, um, who basically settled in Virginia, uh, and is actually where they uh, were, how shall I say, immured in the, in the uh, penal colony for a time. But uh, nonetheless, Idumia was actually Edom, and as you know, Edom means red or ruddy. So, as I said, principally between uh, this war took place between the Brutish Moors of Brutium, hence is one of the reasons why they were named Brutish. Um, and then you had the Brutish or British amalgamated Moors of England. Um, and 
these two factions were actually warring with the uh, Albion, a so-called English subject male. And, um, and so, as I said, you had the two factions of Moors that were called Brutish. Um, and they were called Brutish or British because of a covenant that they had bet between one another or between the two uh, families, as it were. Uh, hence is where you get the term Brit or Brit, which means covenant uh, from the ancient Moabite in Hebrew. And we see evidence of this in the January 23rd, uh, 1721 treaty between um, the Moors of Marrakesh and also the Moors of the Amalgamated Moors of England. Now, just to backtrack for a minute, I talked about Komasa Kumkani, Cape Cod Bay, um, Massachusetts, and the Bourne Stone, which, as I said, is an ancient legal document dating back to about 500 BCE, and this gets into, again, uh, the whole land title issue. Um, and um, I, I also cover this, or talk about this, in uh, Libretto II of the Consecrated Talisman, which is an absolute land conveyance document um, that's documented or recorded or archived uh, in Homeland Security. Um, it's in the Royal Archives of the Medina Sidonia family in Spain, uh, Latino. Um, it's also in the Department of State, etc. But anyway, this particular document, uh, Libretto II, is titled uh, Geográficas para materia que familia analis. Uh, Imperium Morosium a Gentilicio Sanguinis, which is the Great Geodetic Survey and Family Chronicle of the Moorish Empire and its Blood Right Heirs, which basically um, is a survey, a global... You heard that right, Blood Right Heirs. Now, who's the Blood Right Heirs, according to Noble Drew Ali? And are they kicking it? What? The Canaanites? The <coughs> Amalites? <laughs> Amalekites? I mean, shit, you got to clear your throat to get this shit out. That's how hard it is to spit out the Confederacy. You tell me who the Confederacy is and guarantee you might choke on that shit. It's venomous, man. It's venomous snakes, man. Moab, so these are the heirs. So they are rocking it for their heirs, specifically the bloodline of Moab, Morocco, specifically the Mars. But anyway, this particular document, uh, the Breto II, is titled... Uh, Geográficas para materia que familiae analis, uh, Imperium Morosium a Gentilicio Sanguinis, which is the Great Geodetic Survey and Family Chronicle of the Moorish Empire and its Blood Right Heirs, which hey. basically um, is a survey, a global survey, again, geodetic survey of the entire globe, uh, giving you the meets and bounds, etc. And this document is to be used in conjunction um, with the Bourne Stone. Now, what's very interesting about that mm. is also as to how we've been conditioned or trained to see things um, is we think of these ancient uh, monoliths, um, pyramids and things like that as artifacts, um, which is a term, a popularized term that's used by so-called archaeologists, uh, grave robbers, whatever you want to call them. But um, these things are actually legal documents and should be used in every and all instances concerning um, uh, so-called claims to land. And I say so-called claims because claim is, is actually an illegal term, but in terms of asserting rights, uh, birthright inherited rights to the land, uh, these, um, these uh, particular monoliths, structures, etc., should be used as legal documents because, in fact, they are. Um, so, before I go any further with that, I wanted to know, were there any questions about that? Right. Okay. So, anyway, um, I left off at the Bourne Stone, and, um, in terms of it being a legal document, and the fact that uh, it should be used as such in conjunction with, in particular, for the Elementi of Ad Maurium, um, Moorish Americans uh, in general. Um, and so, this particular legal document, uh, as I said, uh, the Great Geodetic Survey and Family Chronicle, also known as the Book of Blood and Deeds, uh, is uh, Libretto II, Part II of the Consecrated Talisman, 
um, which the consecrated talisman in and of itself, the whole book is uh, an absolute land conveyance document, legal document, um, irrefutable and incontrovertible by anyone. And, um, and as I said, it is documented and, and it's archived in uh, the various uh, governmental archives that I mentioned. Uh, as I said also, the royal family uh, and the duchess of Medina Sidonia. And um, uh, let's see. But anyway, uh, I wanted to go back to the uh, starting from the 1721 treaty. Now, also what's very interesting about that is that this particular treaty was dealing with the issue of uh, extraterritoriality um, between these two groups of Moors, and many of the treaties that they made during that time. <laughs> Got him. Man, I was, I was listening real good, y'all. Man, I was listening real good. Been working on that, been working on listening. It's an art form, man. Eh? All right. Between these two groups of Moors. So you can't be speaking for both groups of Moors when you claim all the land for Ham and Cush. You can't be speaking for those that are protecting the holy city. Two groups of more. So, all right. So that's just more validation. Just like we got out the uh, Seer the Duke. All right. Irrefutable and incontrovertible by anyone. And um, and as I said, it is documented and, and it's archived in uh, the various uh, governmental archives that I mentioned. Uh, as I said, also the royal family uh, and the duchess of Medina Sidonia. And, um, uh, let's see, but anyway, uh, I wanted to go back to the, uh, starting from the 1721 treaty. There's now, also, what's very interesting about that is that this particular treaty was dealing with the issue of, uh, extraterritoriality, um, between these two groups of Moors, and many of the treaties that they made during that time um, were also dealing with the same issue of extraterritoriality in many parts of Europe. So you had treaties between the Moors of Marrakesh um, and uh, the Moors of Holland um, in the 1600s, uh, like 1610, 1653, 57, 58. And many of these treaties, believe it or not, are still in force, as quiet as it may be kept. Um, and uh, so you have treaties between the Moors of Marrakesh uh, and the Moors of Germany, because as you know, the European system uh, concerning what they call Germany today didn't uh, exist until, I believe it is, 1873, 1874. Uh, so we're talking about treaties with the Moors of Germany, uh, Bavaria, um, uh, also the Moors of Thrace, uh, Bulgaria, um, Harris um, Albania, Serbia, all of these places were actually still a part of the, and, and still are actually today, a part of the Moorish Empire, um, but also under the Moorish Osman or Ottoman rule, um, which I'm going to get into in a little while in terms of the expansion of the Ottoman Empire. And what's very interesting about that is that in the 1492 period, of Spain, uh, when they talk about, you know, the Moors uh, falling in Spain and this, that, and the other, it was the fall of the empire, that's not accurate or completely accurate in that the, the Moorish Osman Empire at that time, uh, 1492, and even going back 50 years before that or prior to that, uh, was expanding, as I said, all the way from Anatolia and the Kremia to as far as the Americas. In fact, uh, the expansion um, after the head of Satan was taken, uh, in fact, Prophet Abu Ali talks about that in the 101 questionnaire, uh, I believe it's questions 83 and 84, um, where he talks about the head of Satan being taken. Um, what's interesting about that is, I guess 
we can look at it, you know, from the symbolic sense um, in terms of so-called Roman rule, but actually what they call the Byzantine Empire didn't really exist. Um, it was what is known today as uh, Romania, uh, Transylvania, etc. And I know Transylvania, of course, will conjure memories of or thoughts of Count Dracula, that kind of thing. And what's very interesting is that there was uh, this part of the Moorish Empire was in 1453, around that time, was invaded uh, by a Roman horde and led by a particular clan, uh, the Dracul fam uh, family, which um, was later known as Dracula, or the family of Dracula. And Vlad Dracul was uh, Count Dracula, or actually Prince Dracula's father. And uh, Vlad Dracul who was a member of the Secret Order of the Devil, a so-called secret society, uh, they were um, the leaders of this particular Roman horde who had invaded this part of the Moorish Empire. And so um, shortly thereafter, you had what uh, has become known in history as the, uh, the Ottoman Wars. And so it was during this time, 1453, where the head of Satan was taken, and the head of Satan was actually Dracula's father that Mehmed II, or Muhammad the Conqueror, uh, took. Um, and so, uh, I think it was shortly thereafter that Prince uh, Dracula uh, was killed by the Moors in, uh, during the war in 1462. And so, after this, as I said, what it did was that it opened up the empire uh, beyond belief. And uh, so it was still flourishing in many parts of the globe, as I said, all the way to the Americas, um, in Brutium, as well as Mauritania, uh, Algeria, which is uh, known to you today as Minnesota. Um, Algeria was also known, Minnesota, its ancient name was Numidia. Uh, I know uh, many of the Moors, like Brother Asir, had talked about the Moors uh, being known as Numidians at one time. And uh, prior to that, they were known as Anamim. Prior to that, they were known as Gaituli, or of the Gaitulian family. Uh, they were also known as Garamantes. Uh, these were many of the names by which uh, the Moors were known. They were the Patrusim, the Kastrufim. Uh, they were the, uh, the Lubim, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but as I said, this was uh, in Numidia, which had, which had opened up. You also had... Um, so right quick, Numidia is... Minnesota is... Algier? In real time. I mean, when you got the brother teach me to be priest in higher mark, kicking it about the Grand Canyon in Egypt, right here, then you have to fit everything else in that. You got to surf that way. I mean... What do you have to lose? We're only talking about reality here. And if this, you know what I'm saying, bro right here can have all these dots open and say, hey, look, man, I do got some drop. You know what I'm saying? Jerusalem, New York, Algier, Minnesota. He, he's bringing all this down to Philadelphia. He's bringing all of it down here. Then this is ancient land. And you have to get out of the hijack, get out of the static. Open your eyes, use your senses, look around. You're looking for consciousness, it's that thing you're swimming in. Alright, it's, it's, it's pretty good, I mean, I'm just trying to kick back. Because we're going, I know we're going to find something real crazy. Real crazy, real soon, so let's go. Um, um, in Libya, which as I said earlier is Barca, Chicago, all of these areas opened up. <laughs> I mean, there you go. We didn't have to wait long. That was eight seconds. Libya is Chicago. Again, Egypt is here. What did that brother Hiram just say? What did Teach just say? About the artifacts. Libya, Chicago. You got the artifacts in Burroughs Cave. You got the Illinois, everything going down. From there all the way to Arizona. And all of that just ain't. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Thoughts having complete, you know what I'm saying? I mean, the Most High put Joseph up to rock for a minute. You know what I'm saying? Moses rocked out of that. 
order was always there. So look at that as yours. You know what I'm saying? Don't look at that as, oh, that's Egypt. Nah, man, that's yours. The Most High always had order there. He did what he had to do. Did the, uh, you know what I'm saying, the uh, alchemical process, man. Purified, put the pressure on it, separated. Then brought it together again, and unified it and purified it again. Now we're coming out a substance, a vibration, a frequency. And that's what it's all about. What it's all about. All right, interesting. Libya, Chicago, let go. But as a result of what took place in Istanbul, uh, so-called Constantinople, 1453, <coughs> believe it or not. And um, so um, after this was done by Mehmed II, uh, also known as uh, Muhammad the Conqueror, um, the empire, as I said, flourished beyond belief. So, I just wanted to veer off a little concerning that whole history, but I'm going to get back to the... Oh, we got some of that history out the OSB. I mean, Thoth raised up Muhammad. They started conquering. They went up against the false Christ. Now you have Christians and Muslims warring even today because you have the false Christ. And then you have this angel, Thoth, alias Gabriel. And they're all warring, fallen celestial entity so when they say mars they're not talking about some planet mars they're talking about a celestial sky area they're not talking about aliens because there ain't no outer space we're talking about energy we're talking about fallen angel energy so when you see a gray alien just think energy fallen angel demonic energy that's all we're talking about wandering stars mars is a wandering stars a planet a fixed plane Wondering. Let's go. The 1700s, the American Revolution uh, era, and as I said, the beginnings of the United States Corporation. Um, so, in looking at the events, the history, etc., um, and the wars that took place, uh, the so-called American Revolution with the Albion subjects, so-called English, English subjects, um, these individuals, though, or despite the fact that they were warring with the uh, brutish Moors of, um, of Brutium, Comasa Kumkanit, and the, uh, the Moors, the Amalgamated Moors of England, they nonetheless sought assistance from the royals, or the so-called Continental Congress, uh, to construct and sanction what would later become the Declaration of Independence, uh, so-called 1776 era. Wow, so again... He just reinforced whoever they're calling these Moors and these Moors and these Moors in England that all these dark Moors were not in, on the same page. Now we can tie in what they're calling Mongols and Karyats. Now we can tie in Preston John and Genghis Khan. Now we can tie in these warring melanated super families. Their gripe is against Joshua. Their gripe is against your Moses. Their gripe is against anyone that is outside of their confederacy because they do well together. They've done well together. But are they united today? Where are they today? Where is their pyramid today? Oh, Thoth is going to save them. Is Thoth their savior? Going to give them soul force and raise up some technology out of the halls of Amente? To give them soul force, celestial force, still running his ass off from the hounds of the barrier, still running his ass off from the angels of the firmament. Uh, now, the royals of the Congress, comprehending well the continental condition and the shifting of the balance of power, uh, despite, again, the Albion conflict with the Brutish, uh, the royals factored into the equation. Uh, universal and planetary conditions, which then, of course, takes me back to where I started with the whole axis, uh, consciousness, grid shift changes. Um, and I'm going to go into that. Um, what's very interesting about that and the whole magnetic field collapsing, etc., of uh, what took place in Atlantis, is that uh, when we look at that, in relation to what occurred then and what is expected to occur in the very near future. Um, when you talk about these consciousness axis shift 
changes. Um, and as I said, going back to the language issue and one of the reasons why, you know, the, the ancients dealt with um, these particular melodic tones um, was that these, uh, I'm sorry, the, the magnetic field that I'm talking about, when it collapses and human memory is then affected, uh, or loss of memory and memory retention, um, it is right before an actual shift in one consciousness and two dimensional shift changes. Now, when we talk about dimensional shift changes, we of course give uh, consideration to, again, the grid science. And when you're talking about the grids, um, Listen up. grids, as I said, ultimately also affect consciousness as well. Um, grids affect consciousness. So when they thought set up a Christ conscious grid, I think they said they put it up in the 80s. You got to go back to that spirit science again, man. I'm trying to tell you. Because they did drop and put some babies in the bathwater when it came to what they did and what they done. So let's suppose that there was some, some, some grid put up in the 80s. <laughs> man, it affects consciousness. It affects your reality. Man, we're breaking the spell. For example, we're now in the third dimension and moving into the so-called fourth dimension. Um, and when you have um, this movement of dimensions or interfacing of dimensions, one dimension tends to uh, recede as the other dimension comes into view. Mm. Um, now, just to focus on that for a minute, what's very important uh, to bear in mind, and um, when we talk about these consciousness grid uh, uh, shifts and changes, is uh, and and also trying to recall what occurred in Atlantis, um, that once this magnetic field collapses, when a magnetic field and a planetary axis shift occurs, um, there are a number of things. A number of things that happen. One of those things is that um, you have a number of incidences that occur. You have chaos that's going on, uh, or buildup of chaos uh, on the planet everywhere. You have people li literally losing their mind. Uh, we're actually close to that point right now. And when people begin to lose their mind, uh, they of course don't really know what the heck is going on, what the hell is going on. Um, but what's happening is that there's a ripple in the magnetic field. And the ripple in the magnetic field is actually the thing that's affecting um, emotional bodies. Um, now, of course, for those of us who will in fact be aware of these particular changes, consciousness grid shift changes, um, we'll know exactly what to look for, what not to look for, what to do, what not to do. Um, also, when you have these dimensions interfacing, third, fourth dimension uh, interfacing, uh, and the uh, the grid consciousness and third dimension receding uh, into the fourth dimension, um, this is a period of five or six hours uh, th that um, you have the ripple of magnetic effects. And when that happens, not only do you have, as I said, third dimension receding, but you have all of the objects in the third dimension receding. In other words, any artificial manufactured objects um, that... Uh, exist in the third dimension begin to disappear um, and as I said a lot of people will be losing their minds because they won't know what's going on um, and you begin to see images from the fourth dimension showing up in the third dimension uh, but it's important to recall that when this happens that you're not to actually touch anything um, as a matter of fact this uh, brings back memories of the first Raiders of the, of the Lost Ark when they were tied to the pole and uh, they opened up the Ark of the Covenant and you had these spirits come out of the box and Harrison Ford told the young lady that was strapped to the pole with him you know not to touch anything in fact not to even look at anything um, because what happens is that if you touch something or you look at it uh, too long or for or 
too long a period, you actually get sucked into the dimension too quickly. And uh, when that happens, well, you know, uh, you have a, a series of problems. Um, but also, what happens during this time is that um, uh, for a period of three to five days, when the magnetic field collapses and you have this consciousness grid shift changing, you go into a complete void, uh, a black void, and uh, your feel of view and feel of vision, everything just disappears uh, until the actual dimensional shift. Um, and so, um, this is one of the things that we definitely have to be prepared for uh, in the next few years. But, so as to get back to uh, the, uh, the continental United States, that whole thing, um, in terms of the royals factoring into the equation, which is what caused me to veer off into the whole dimensional shift, consciousness, access, grid, shift, change, is the universal and planetary conditions that they factored into uh, the whole equation. Thus is why they gave great consideration to sanctioning the Declaration of Independence for these Albions. Um, so they thought it prudent to grant the request and saw that these particular Cretans uh, were among those that could be properly instructed in the science of government. So they wisely sought to do this as a means of long-range kikatrikis. Uh, kikatrikis is basically a form of cisitration. Cisitration is uh, the forming of a chrysalis or a all right, all right, before we get fancy, it appears right here he's breaking down or giving his justification for why they decided to mix in to, uh, you know, <laughs> leaven with these particular energies, these lower level vibrations. I mean, could it be that they felt responsible for them since they opened up, you know, that dimensional tear, since they tore and ripped open <laughs> whatever portal, whatever situation they did from Atlantis or before or after, whatever Montauk situation, maybe they felt responsible for these energies that are being parasitic on this earth. And they said, well, this is the reason why we felt we could. You know, let's, let's listen to this last minute again, man. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm bugging them, man. Listen close. And so, um, this is one of the things that we definitely have to be prepared for uh, in the next few years. But, so as to get back to uh, the, uh, the continental United States, that whole thing, um, in terms of the royals factoring into the equation, which is what caused me to veer off into the whole dimensional shift, consciousness, access, grid, shift, change, is the universal and planetary conditions that they factored into uh, the whole equation, thus is why they gave great consideration to sanctioning the Declaration of Independence for these Albions. Um, Albions. Alba. Alba. Sounds like albino. Sounds like albino. So they thought it prudent to grant the request and saw that these particular Cretans, these particular Cretans, these royals, these albinos, these Cretans, we saw that these particular white folk uh, were among those that could be properly instructed in the science of government. We could instruct these white folk on government. Now, hindsight is twenty twenty. Did that work out for anybody? We could instruct them on, you know, the government of colonizing. Remember, they had 13 colonies. You only need a colony when you're colonizing. You heard the brother Asir and them talk about they're the original 13 colonies. Uh, the brother Uno left a great comment. Uh, he lo loves the bro. Always on time. Never a day late. Never a dollar show. The brother left a great uh, drop. You know what I'm saying? About, um, you know what I'm saying? These 13 colonies, essentially they gave or, you know, however gave up their 13 colonies to the so-called Caucasian and they wanted more so they said nah we want more so listen to they're always opening up tearing ripping open these dimensional you know portal tears they're, they're, they're ripping this shit clean open 
they did it here, then they helped him break down another barrier to reach you and find you here, so-called Negro. <laughs> now they finally find you here, and these people instruct them on how to further colonize you. To veer off into the whole dimensional shift, consciousness, access, grid, shift, change, is the universal and planetary conditions that they factored into uh, the whole equation. Thus, Universal and planetary conditions that they factored into the whole equation, these 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 albinos he's saying he's saying it listen up this is why they gave great consideration to sanctioning the declaration of independence for these albions albions albino let go um so oh. they thought it prudent to grant the request and saw that these particular cretans uh were among those that could be properly instructed in the science of government so they wisely sought to do this as a means of long-range kikatrikis. Hmm. Uh, kikatrikis is basically a form of cisitration. Cisitration is uh, the forming of a chrysalis or a scab, uh, much like the one you fall, form on your body when you uh, cut yourself, and uh, which was a, a means of healing the Moorish nation and the land as well over, like I said, a long-range period of time. A long-range time, so you make a deal with the devil to heal something in the long range, to heal the land. Hindsight is twenty twenty, right? How did that work out for you? I mean, can you really sit here today in 2017, look at your present condition, and look at actual, factual events that went down, the massacre that went down, and stand by this shit and say, this is why we made these deals? made these treaties with these Cretans. It was wisdom. We wisely made that move. They still see this shit as a wise move. To them, any abuse, any, uh, you know what I'm saying, any drop they can have on you. That's what they think is that they got the drop on you, these Moors over these Moors. To them, you're the dirty Moor. To us, they're the heathen. They are the heathen. But to them, we're the dirty Moors, these Israelites. Ah, we want it for Moab. We want it for Morocco. We want it for Atlantis. How did that work out, this Atlas, son of Poseidon? Yeah, the son of Poseidon's name is Atlas, and the plural form is Atlantis. So all when you say it's Atlantis and you claim it, you're claiming a hijacked fallen angel. The son of Poseidon setting up the first ten dynastic kingdoms or rulers or Nesuts of Atlantis times. The first ten dynastic ones. Setting it off here in Atlantis, which is here in Egypt, which is where in the Grand Canyon, all throughout Illinois. Like he said, Libya is Chicago. So at this time, you had the fourth Prisons or president, uh, John Hancock Bay, and the rest of the Congress who agreed to sanction or authenticate the declaration uh, of these British subjects and give them instruction under, under the tutelage of Emmanuel Muali Ben Bay Justice. It was also during this uh, seven years war period that the Moorish national flag was removed uh, during the time of the Crow. And when I say during the time of the Crow, I'm talking about the Korniks, um, meaning the seventh Chrysans, known as Ion Gracalus, uh, but more commonly known as John J. Bay. And so, um, at this time, we have, uh, concerning these particular events, uh, which were all a culmination of the 300 years conflict dating back to 1494 during the Taurus, uh, the, uh, the Pontifex, or the, um, the Papal Bulls and the Treaty of Tordesillas, uh, during the so-called Christopher Columbus Cretan era involving the so-called Spanish conquest of Latin Spain. Uh, and notice how he said Christopher Columbus Cretan era. So when he just referred to making a deal with the Cretans, now he is referring to that with Columbus, which is why some people say, oh, Columbus was black or he is a Moor. Either way, we know that he had a treaty with these guys, that he found the ones... One group of Indians warring with the other group of Indians. One group of Moors against the other Moors. One group of Khans in America. 
one group of cons against the other group of cons. Titles, titles, titles. Let's go. Um, and um, I talked about uh, McMed the Second and the Empire opening up uh, for uh, the Moors. Um, <laughs> this was actually, as I said, during the time of the seventh ruler, McMed the Second. Um, hmm. In fact, I would refer you to Libretto 13, uh, The Consecrated Talisman, The Genealogy of the Imperial Dragon Court and Count Dracula. Also, Libretto 18, 720 questions uh, to ask a Moorish American. So, anyway, the Osman Empire, as I said, opened up or expanded as far as uh, Brutium, uh, which Admiral, <clears throat> excuse me, Admiral Ahmed Muhyiddin, Piri Ibn Ajim Mehmed, uh, documents in uh, the naval book known as the Kitabi Barrei, including the world famous Piri Reis Bay, Portolano uh, of the Americas, as an integral part of the Moorish Osman Empire, um, which was the same map which was presented to uh, Muhammad the Conqueror's grandson, Yavu Salim I, uh, who was the ninth ruler in 1517. Um, so the map was presented to him by Piri Reis Bay himself. And um, it's the most accurate map uh, to date uh, concerning the uh, Americas using both polar projection geometry, plane and spherical trigonometry, uh, which is basically a fancy way for saying converting one form of math to another. Um, thus is why when the map then resurfaced in 1929 in the Saturday Library in Istanbul, the United States Secretary of State, Charles H. Um, or Henry Stimson, rather, at that time, uh, via the United States Ambassador Charles A. Sherrill, for whom Henry Stimson gave a series of instructions um, to acquire copies of the map from Yusuf Akota Bey, who was the president of the Moorish Historical Society. Um, uh, but basically, Henry Stimson wanted copies of the map for the sole purpose of, of uh, finding evidence of the so-called Christian Columbus uh, land discovery claim of the Americas, unfortunately only to find empirical evidence of the ancient Moorish presence in America. Uh, I refer you to Libretto 8, 360 questions to ask a Moorish American. Um, and uh, also, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Libretto 7. So now this brings us to 1795 period, uh, Selim Khan, uh, who was also known as Selim II of the line of Muhammad the Conqueror, known as the most powerful Whoa. of all the princes Wait of the minute. empire commanding the two lands and the two seas. Uh, Y'all thought this was play play. Y'all really thought this was play play. I said, is this the one group of Moors against another group of Moors? One group of cons against another group of cons. And then we have the chariots being its own section or section, or, you know what I'm saying? Then that's connected to the Kenites, which is connected to these Rechabites, which is you're getting back, back to Jeremiah 28. These Rechabites, Kenites, chariots, King David, this tribe of Moses. Now, who are they warring against? Um, and, uh, also, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Libretto 7. So now this brings us to 1795 period, uh, Selim Khan, uh, who was all... Khan. Selim Khan. Let's go. Also known as Selim II of the line of Muhammad the Conqueror. Of the line of Muhammad. So you have these Khans. Remember, Khan is not a name, but a title. So you're just saying the ruler, whoever was the ruler, was the Khan. Who got the Khan? Now they call it Cohen, the Cohen gene, the Cohen, the Khan. It's the title of who was ruling. So a Khan is not a one particular bloodline. Just like a Mongol is not one particular bloodline. Just like a Moor is not one particular bloodline. Which is why they keep saying Moorish. Moorish, Jewish, blackish. 
Moorish American. I mean, if we're just talking Moab, say Moabites. Be specific. But Moorish, great ish. Hmm. You know, it makes it very general. Oh, a bunch of Moorish Americans were here. Moorish. Some were Moabites, some were not quite. They were other Shemites. They were more ish. I mean, again, do you say black ish or are you black? And if you're not black, say I ain't black. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Are you white ish? Are you this ish? Are you cool ish? Or is you cool or is you ain't? You can't be cool ish, right? So more ish, what does it mean? Known as the most powerful of all the princes of the empire commanding the two lands and the two seas. Uh, now those two lands and two seas uh, were Galilee and uh, Libya, which, as I said before, are known to you as Michigan and Chicago. Galilee is Michigan and Libya is Chicago. And this is what Muhammad was ruling. Thoth was ruling. Listen up, man. The truth sounds stranger than fiction. Now, Salim Khan was the individual who entered into the Treaty of Peace and Friendship, or the Perpetual Treaty of Peace and Friendship, uh, between Tunis and uh, the United States of America. Now, Tunis... Whoa! So, look, this Khan made a deal with the corporation. So, remember, you have this Prester John, this Wang Khan being taken out by his foster son or blood nephew, brother's son, this other Khan. This other group of cons. So either, you know, he was a foster son. Either way, Genghis Khan hijacked his way into the Khan title and took out his uncle or foster father or something like that. Where we're getting in these Mongol carries. Now we can connect it. So this Khan makes a deal with the devil for rulership, overthrowing another Khan. Of course, at that time, uh, as I said, it was known as Tunis, but prior to that, it was Funis. Uh, it was also known as Carthage. Uh, prior to that, it was known as Pornicium, which again is also Galilee. Whoa, um, Michigan. But now, uh, as I said, <clears throat> Salim Khan also ruled the two seas in addition to these two lands. The two seas were the Adriatic Sea and the Aegean Sea. Now, the Adriatic Sea is uh, Lake Superior. Mm. The Aegean Sea is uh, Lake Michigan. Mm. <laughs> um, but now, the interesting thing about this is that Selim Khan agreed to enter into this treaty in uh, August of 1797, March 26, 1799, uh, for the simple reason of the Bellicose <sighs> conflicts that were going on in and throughout the Americas at that time. And also, as I said earlier, the fact that the Moorish Navy had fallen on the uh, Sea of Galilee in West Palestine, 1795. So the first reason he entered into the treaty is because of the conflict that he already got. Because of the melanated so-called Indian War already happening here, which connected to the war that was happening in so-called Europe and England and the Scottish and the Picts and the these different clans coming out, fighting against, you know what I'm saying, um, King James and them. You know what I'm saying, fighting against the Romans. The Picts were always whooping up on Romans, man. So, then you had these other people making deals with the Romans. Making deals. Alright? You see two different, you know, lineages or, or energies. You see chaos, you see order. One has a chaotic perspective of of earth as a moroccan empire for moab and the canaanites and the creator has established order so now what's very interesting about this is that no sooner than this was done you had the beginning of what became known as the westward expansion of the europeans when they started basically uh bogarting and stealing lands uh, all across the Americas, from Kentucky all the way to California. And the reason why I say from Kentucky to California, because these particular uh, kingdoms, so-called states, 
uh, were key in this expansion, uh, starting from the Treaty of Greenville in 1795, the 1800 uh, Harrison Land Act, um, and also the Yazoo Act of uh, 1795. So now the westward expansion lasted all the way until 1890, Christian era. And, uh, and as I said, the reason why the expansion started uh, had a lot to do with um, seizing land, but also resources. And one in particular at that time was gold. And the reason why they wanted gold so badly, so desperately, was because their economy, such as it was, uh, was always in a state of arrest and peril. And um, the economy and treasury had been seized by the bankers uh, via the Bank of the United States, um, starting from 1790 during the Alexander Hamilton uh, era, a few years prior to 1795, of course. Uh, so via the Bank of the United States, which was the predecessor uh, that laid the foundation or groundwork for what later became the Federal Reserve Bank, um, but the Bank of the United States, you had the Bank of New York, which was Isaac Roosevelt's baby, who was, of course, the, um, the ancestor of Theodore Roosevelt, who came in with the so-called Square Deal. And then you had uh, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in 33, who brought in the New Deal. Um, and so uh, they were looking to acquire gold because they heard about the goal of the bays, or the hereditary line of Bayes and the Khans, as in Selene Khan, um, which was... I can't make this shit up. I'm just surfing the web. Alright, when we throw this stuff out there, we, we hope to connect. And I've never got this far. I never had time to get this far. A lot of times I've been watching it with you. I got four children. My daughter turns seven tomorrow. Come on, man. All right, so he just said the cons. The cons. Wang Khan, Prester John. One group of Templars, another group of Templars. One group of Moors, one group of cons. Huh? I worked for what later became the Federal Reserve Bank. Um, but the Bank of the United States, you had the Bank of New York, which was Isaac Roosevelt's baby, who was, of course, the... Um, the ancestor of Theodore Roosevelt, who came in with the so-called Square Deal. And then you had uh, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in 33, who brought in the New Deal. Um, and so uh, they were looking to acquire gold because they heard about the goal of the Bays, or the hereditary line of Bays, and the Khans, as in Selene Khan, um, which was in California. So, whoa, oh. the cons are in California. Let me get into the Califia. The cons are in Califia. The cons in Califia. Cons in Califia. Con. Preston John Saliman Califia Sarah Cali. Siba Saba Sheba. Queen Califia, Sarah Kali, Saba, Siba, Sheba, Khan, Juan, Khan, Saliman, Lemna Dangle Dewit, Saliman, Sheba, Saliman, Sheba, Saliman. Y'all flowing with me? Are we wavy, baby? Do we have a Solomon and Sheba right here? And is that why these cons are right here in Cali? Ultimately, or the ultimate goal and destination of the westward expansion was California. Why is that? Because the name California indicates exactly what was there because it was Calif, California. It was the vault of the Calif. So you have, um, as I said, Calif, and then you have uh, Fornia, Fornia or Fornix is the Moorish Latin for vault. Uh, you've heard about Fort Knox. Now, Fort Knox, interestingly enough, 
is not any one place in particular because Fort Knox actually means Fornix. Fort and these dudes are just so treacherous, man, because you're going to skip over the... <laughs> You're going to skip over the richness of the reality, not the myth, not an allegory, the reality of Queen, so-called Queen Caliphia, Sarah Cali. And then talk about it's just the vault about gold. The the fortune, <laughs> the fortune is not about, man, you're going to skip over Sheba. You're going to skip over Khalifa. You're going to skip over Cali to talk about the gold and the vault. That's all they think about. This is chaos. Phoenix means any vault anywhere. Um, and so if you want to say that it is any one specific place, it would actually be 12 places because you have vaults of gold in the, uh, the basement or dungeon or whatever you want to call it in the Federal Reserve Banks. The so-called 12 Federal Reserve Banks, you have gold in uh, the Fortinix. So anyway, this should give you some indication as to, as I said, the whole California uh, Caliph or Vaults of the Caliph thing and as to why they wanted to uh, desperately acquire this gold. Mm. Um, and so, uh, this brings us to um, the period of, as I said, the westward expansion which continued from 1795 for the settlers in and throughout the Moorish dominions of the United States, uh, had long since begun for the Spanish and the Franciscan Dutch from the 60th parallel of the equator, South America, all the way to the Moorish lands of the Nagas in uh, Eudasia or Judasia, today known as Burma and Myanmar. Um, so again, like I said, you had this westward expansion in South America simultaneously while you had it going on in North America. And uh, in South America, as I said, it started long before, starting from the 60th parallel, going all the way up to um, as far west uh, from South America to the land of the Nagas, to uh, Siam, to Malaya, to Sumatra, to Matra. Wait, South America west to the land of the Nagas? Nagas means kings, right? I just took this down because I was like, man, I don't think I'm going to need my old trusted reality simulation today. But just when the going gets rough, you need this smooth water. All right, so Nagas. He said South America, right? So again, look at this now. This is a reality simulation from Arizona. You see the size of South America compared to the rest of so how much do you know about South America? <laughs> how much does anybody really know? Who really goes down there? And again, if our maps were flipped upside down, then the tip of South America is north, not south. Now, he's just talking South America. He's just talking there, guys. And then this reality simulation from Arizona. When you go west in South America, you get into what they call here the Black Coast, the Black Kingdom. That's right where Peru would be. And we're only talking about Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Now, that's Black Kingdoms. Again, on top of that is Kush. On top of that is Egypt, Stagia, Kim, Luxor. On top of that is Shem. We have Argos. We have Ofer. Ofer. We got a lot about that Ofer right here. Now you have Pickland divided into 12 sections or 12 tribes. And then right around here where you, you know, all this would be the four corners. But on top of this is called Samaria. Samaria. So, you know, Samaria uh, connected with that uh, Shemash or Kemash, Kemash or Shemash. The Samaria, the sun god, all that stuff that started was... You know, started being worshipped and was worshipped here with the Atlantis situation and separated. You know, in the days of Peleg, it says, was the earth divided? In the days of Peleg, was the earth divided? And you go over to this so-called Africa and you don't have uh, Kim, you don't have Luxor, you don't have nothing. You have 
Kasala and Vendia and India and Vendia, Utora Kuru, everything but what you think you would find. And all the OG Africa is right here. You have punt. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Don't make us punt you, but hurt. Because punt is right here over the Amazon in South America. All right, connected to Zimbabwe, which is over South America. All this is over South America. And that's why they call this the motherland. That's why they call this the motherland. Now they flip you. Now they flip you. Because when you're over here thinking Africa, Africa, they taking all of your shit. Because you think all melanated people come from Africa. Even that little white boy on the corner in the tank top smoking a cigarette. He eight years old. He said, Nigga, go back to Africa. So even he, even he knows you're from Africa. So that little ignorant little peckerwood <laughs> yelling at you, go back to Africa. He knows just as much as your conscious scholar telling you you from Africa. How does the conscious scholar tell you from Africa and a little peckerer with the cigarette yelling go back to Africa is still telling you from Africa? How are they agreeing? How does your conscious scholar agree? How does Horace Butler agree with the little peckerer on the corner? What level of consciousness is this? Maybe it's in reverse. Maybe this is the motherland. Maybe this is Egypt, Libya, Chicago, Libya, Chicago. Let's get a couple more minutes, man, and we're going to uh, take it on home for the finale. Um, Iaba, Ojaba, Borneo, uh, the Malukas, up to Mindanao, the Sulu Archipelago, um, to the Philippines, Hawaiian Islands, and all the way back to California, uh, 32nd, 40th degree north latitude. Um... And so, one of the reasons for this, on the part of the Spanish and the Franciscan Dutch, was that they were looking to, uh, much like, for those of you who may remember the, the classic sci-fi movie, uh, Doom, where the whole thing was about controlling the spice. So you had the Dutch, who were trying to control the spice, or the so-called spice trade, and therefore had started what later became the Spice Wars, Thus was one of the reasons why the Moors um, in 1774 consolidated their power to form what later became Consoki Vimosa Regnum or so-called uh, United States Corporation Family Corporate Trust, um, basically to protect the family interest uh, that, as I said, was the whole continent of the so-called uh, United States um, and the empire, which is... A, uh, I guess they got cut off, but so yeah, their family interest is everything. <laughs> their family interest is everything. Their family interest is everything for Morocco. All right, so on that, man, we're going to, you know, take it on home for the finale, man. You know what I'm saying? It's been a beautiful ride. Seven part series, man. The more the Moabite, the Muhammad, the Baphomet of Belus. This is the, uh, you know, part seven. Go check out everything else. Maybe we'll go ahead and do a dismount here with this uh, Dark Light 84, man. Reverse history lesson. This is one minute long, man. Love to y'all. Stay up, suit up, choose up. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh. Yeah. Rebecca, an emancipated slave from New Orleans. Wow. Was this 1863? This is an emancipated slave in New Orleans. Reverse his story. This is an emancipated slave, man, in 1863. So these Moors been enslaving these people. These Moors been giving them, you know what I'm saying, work then and then. But then when they made them treaties, man, then they used these people and those people used them. I mean, you know, you can't play both sides of the fence, man. 
when we get into the hidden truth, we're only talking reality. This is America. Look at the setup. Oh, come on. Come on, come on. Hey. Right. I got too excited, my people. My baby. When we were selling Paula. Let go. Let go. Then wear it up to the school. Hell no, nah, we wasn't broke. Nah. Yeah. We just acted a fool. So this is the state of Louisiana. See all the melanated people rocking this now. Which moors are these? Which colonies are these? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. 13 colonies of Moors. Originally. Oh, yeah. Shark tucked in our jeans. We just thought it looked cool. You can say what you want. But that don't make it the truth. When it's 91 outside. Better 69 in my coat. The AC blowing shit. Around the same time the Caucasian was coming out of slavery in Louisiana, the Negro had his own establishment in Louisiana. Yes, and yes, the Moors uh, were, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, jamming everybody up in their establishment. Where were we in their picture, in Morocco's picture? And we smoking that O. Oh, 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 girl, look good. Yeah, yeah I'm scoping that too. Yeah. I heard you got a pregnant. That's yeah. what's up when y'all do. And somebody knocked on my door. Nick, I'm hoping that show. But that's a dream to burn. And that's how it is, man. Stay up, suit up, choose up, man. Keep surfing the wave. Keep loving up, man, on J. Stu and the crew. You know what I mean? Keep loving up, man, because they love you every day. We love the creator. All praise the creator. Hawa, hawa, existence forever. Love y'all.